Get in there. Get in there. Come on. Come on. Get, get in there. Come on. I, I need you to move. I, I need you to take the queen. Come on. Get, get. Originally, I had planned on dropping the pretense from last year of reviewing new toys and nothing else, but when World War II Bumblebee came around, that pretense was dropped entirely, and since then, I've just been reviewing new toy after new toy after new toy. I think it's time to honour that pretense that I set out at the start of the year, even if I didn't really mention it in the videos that much, and discuss one of my favourite voyagers from years prior. Yes, I did actually say Voyager. When it comes to Combiner Wars, many people don't actually remember the individual toys, but rather the completed Combiners are- Oh dear, Oh, this has fallen over. One second, please. Up you go. Oh, Bruticus is taking a bit of a shelf dive as well. Okay, I think it's all good now. So as I was saying, most people don't actually remember the individual toys from Combiner Wars, but rather, they remember the completed Combiners. Especially since they were all released as one big wave, except for the first two waves where they kind of mix things up a little bit. That was helped in no small part by the extreme amount of repaints and retools and reshells that were prevalent in the line. I mean, yeah, Superion and Menasaur were completely new because they were at the start of the line, but Optimus Maximus was entirely repaints. For Defensor, three out of the five members were retools or repaints. Then it was four out of the five figures for Bruticus. Then also four out of the five for Skyrain, although really most people just wanted the Skylinks on his own, and that was one exception to the rule where people remembered the full combiners over the individual figures because I don't think anyone actually combined Skylinks. And then Computron and Victorion were comprised entirely of redecos. Because of this, Rook, the newcomer of the team, was left to the wayside, despite the fact that he is by far a superior figure to Combiner Wars Groove in every single way. It's yet another case of G1 nostalgia taking everything else over. Coupled with the fact that throughout the line people were primarily focusing on the big picture, i.e. completed combiners, Rook doesn't get much love nowadays. So, the question is, does this issue get resolved through an unlicensed upscaling? Well, greetings Cybertronians, I'm Dr. Lockdown, and today's diagnosis pertains to Combiner Wars Rook, specifically the Wei Jang Diecast Edition upscale. So one of the things that Hasbro thought would be a fun idea with Combiner Wars was to swap out one of the pre-established members for a new character. In my opinion, I think that's a really awesome idea. Even though Alpha Bravo was a pre-tool of Blades, he added some much-needed variety to the lineup. I never picked up Off-Road, but his design was really good, and it added some great variety to the team. Then of course there was Rook, who makes much more sense than having an oversized motorcycle because mass shifting! But alas, by the time they got to Bruticus, Hasbro had abandoned this approach due to fan outrage. Not only did they stop the idea of swapping out members, but they found ways to retool existing figures to allow the sets to have the entirely G1 team. Rook was doubly defeated because Takara ended up making an entirely new mold to replace him. It's an incredible shame too, because in vehicle mode, Rook is f***ing brilliant. Forget motorcycles, this is the kind of vehicle that exudes the chunk of a leg bot. What really sells you on the utilitarian nature of this design is the sheer amount of mechanical detail. Every surface has been given realistic greebling, and as such you really get a sense for the personality of the vehicle. Bold, sturdy, beefy, CHUNK! Honestly, I'll take this kind of detailing over the more fan-favorite flat designs that evoke the simplicity of the cartoon. Well, I say simplicity, but I really mean corner cutting. Unlike the robots in disguise, Star Convo- uh, I mean Optimus Prime that I reviewed, the paint applications remain largely the same. The only differences are in the shades they use. The windows are gunmetal instead of black, the blue is slightly lighter than the original, and the yellow is a little more fluorescent. Aside from that, it's largely the same. All the paint applications are spot on, whereas with the previous Wei Jang KO I reviewed, they changed a few things for seemingly no reason. Not that I hated that approach, but Rook's paint applications were so calculated that swapping some of them out would have caused issues. Another plus is that they didn't include the god-awful Weijang logo this time. This means you're free to add an Autobot symbol from the get-go, although the ones I applied were done terribly. Fun fact, I was completely unable to get rid of the Weijang symbol because apparently they've laminated over it! Unfortunately, there are a couple of issues with this mold. For starters, the blue paint is rather messy. It's applied nice and thickly, but you'll notice a few parts where it's chipped off at the front. 
except it hasn't actually chipped off, but rather the paint hasn't properly covered the edges. Oddly enough, it's only the blue paint too, as if the shade wasn't properly mixed before application. The paint is incredibly durable though, so you won't have to worry about any actual chipping down the line. On the topic of paint though, there are definitely some improvements that could have been made. The main one I feel would be the toolkits on the sides. On a retail release, sure, having this whole section splotched in silver is fine. On a Voyager figure though, well I wouldn't have minded paying an extra five bucks to get this painted a little better. Now yes, even with the postage from Sir Toys, this only came to about 35 bucks, which is about how much you'd pay for a deluxe nowadays. And that's already including die cast metal. So under the assumption that they're clearly doing things for cheaper, some upgraded paint apps, especially here, would have been nice. On the topic of die cast metal though, the wheels probably should have been a little bit bigger because at present there's some chipping going on with the chest. It's not because of the paint they used, because that's really durable, but rather it's the fact that it's rubbing against the floor as you roll it. So don't roll it, some of you might say, but come on. This guy is incredibly doopty doopty doable. While we're on the wheels, no silver paint? Really? And clipped wheels on a Voyager? Come on. I suppose that's part of doing business with an upscaled knockoff that costs the same as a base deluxe figure though. Some of the things are easily going to get cut, and Wei Jang didn't really want to invest in fixing some of these issues. They wanted to get a chunky solid figure out into the Chinese market that little kids could bang around. The only thing out of these issues that really bugs me is the blue paint. Aside from that, eh, whatever. Of course, of course, as with all Combiner Wars figures, he comes with two accessories. You get the standard hand foot gun, where they actually added some silver detail that wasn't present in the original. Huh. Go figure. I really like how the knuckle dusters look like anchors that can fire into other surfaces, as if he's trying to pull down the rubble to save civilians. Nice touch. He's also got a taser fork for those times when you're trying to eat oysters but they've turned into drug addicts camping out at Redfern Station. Thankfully, it's a slightly darker shade of grey, because the lighter, shinier shade Hasbro stupidly decided to use was oddly reminiscent of Games Workshop grey. You've got a couple of ports around the body to use them, but they all look stupid unless you use the one specifically designed for this vehicle mode. This bulbous peg that was originally only 5mm, is designed to incorporate the hand foot gun as a turret, if you transform into foot configuration, and the fork can peg into the open port at the front of the vehicle. As far as weapon integration goes, this is probably the best out of the entire Combiner Wars line, aside from maybe Ultra Magnus, but after the Siege rendition, who really remembers Ultra Magnus? Due to the rotation in the thumb, the turret actually gets some brilliant rotation. Unfortunately, it looks somewhat silly if you use one or the other. It looks awesome when you use both, but something seems off if you only go halfway. Size-wise, is a chunky boy, even by Voyager standards. I'm pleasantly surprised at how well he looms over official Transformers. This size also suits the vehicle type better. Also, fun fact, if you semi-transform him, you can access the cannons from the robot mode. Pretty neat, if you ask me. So you may be wondering why I have Studio Series Dropkick in frame here. Well, that's just to illustrate a point. I'm not actually going to transform him. The way Rook works is very similar to how many Studio Series cars work, in the sense that it's not really a shell former per se, but it definitely does have a lot of the top half of the vehicle mode form up into a very cohesive backpack. And I just want to say that overall, it doesn't feel underdone, despite being an upscale deluxe. It really shows that the transformation was very satisfying on the original toy. First thing you want to do is get the head just a little bit to the back. That will get it out of the way so that you can open up this section here. From here, the arms detach by going up a little bit. Then you rotate it out to the side. After those are out of the way, then you can collapse the backpack. Come around to the front and separate the legs. You'll notice here that the thigh is collapsed into the lower leg, and just like most Combiner Wars things, it swings out on a double hinge, and that will slot into there. From there, you bring these feet up. I'm not sure how they lock into place in both modes, but for some reason, they're able to lock into place, but they're on double hinges, and then the ankles will work just fine. From here, you rotate the arms around, and then you can bring them down. And finally, you bring the head the rest of the way down and rotate it 180 degrees. And there you have Rook. Gotta say, he's a chunky yet handsome bugger. Despite the fact that it's very hard to keep focus on him with my camera, I'm still learning this. So remember all those chunky fellas from Siege? You know how they exhibit chunk without actually being crazy on the kibble or feeling hollow and lifeless? 
Well, Rook here was the predecessor to that. If anything, he feels too good to be part of Combiner Wars. Most figures from that line blend into each other until you're left with a generic blob in the vague shape of a dead-end mold. Rook seems to be one of the only toys that has escaped that curse, with a striking design, impeccable moulding, amazing articulation and beautiful colours. The head sculpt is a wonderful mix of castle chess piece and an American football helmet, which is already a step up from... Uh, this. Yeah, due to most G1 versions requiring heads that double as ports for the combined modes, most Scramble City limb heads are kind of boring. The chest is absolutely lovely, incorporating the wheels and combiner ports superbly into the body. His waist is a tad weird, but his feet are perfectly chunky for the robot design on show. And wow, he has ankle tilts! Nowadays with Siege, it's pretty much taken for granted, but for Combiner Wars, this is really amazing. One thing I really love is how the hands work. To shake things up a bit, the hands are molded closed, and instead of traditional 5mm ports, he has 5mm cannons protruding from the knuckles. Well, they were 5mm originally, they're probably a different diameter now. Surprisingly, the taser fork doesn't look bad when plugged in this way. It looks way more natural than I expected, and at the very least, it looks better than the shoulder attachments. This also comes with a plus of being able to use his combiner ports as Hulk hands. It looks alright, but honestly, I never actually liked this configuration. I get it's really popular to do this, but personally I think it looks way more stupid than it should. Maybe if the hands were smaller, like with the perfect effect upgrades, it would look better, but as it stands, I just don't really like it. Besides, this is the only upscale Combiner Wars figure I have, so I can't really use two hands at once. It's not like the regular hand foot guns work anyway. One thing I do like is how they handled the backpack. I was really concerned it would be cumbersome, as it's formed from a huge chunk of the vehicle mode, but in person it doesn't look that bad. It really lends itself to the chunky aesthetic. It could be a little closer to the body, but for a deluxe figure turned Voyager, it's fine. I do wish they'd found a way to cover up the top section though, maybe with an extra hinge. That brings me to the main floor of this figure, hollowness. Maybe I've become a bit more cynical in recent times, or maybe it's because I'm biased to how Siege has changed things up for the better, but looking back on Combiner Wars and Titan's Return, these hollow sections are starting to bug me a lot more than they used to. It could also be that this is especially annoying because of the upscaling process, but that's just a reason, it's not an excuse. One of the purposes of these videos is to highlight individual flaws of a figure, and when something is as frustrating as this, even if I understand the reasoning behind it, I can't let it go unspoken. The top section of the backpack is completely hollow, the backs of the arms are also completely hollow, when they could have easily let these Kipley panels fold down to cover it. Look at these legs! If there is one thing I'll give Power of the Primes credit for, they at least made an effort to cover up the hollow parts, which then extended into Siege with much better execution. But even then, why did Weijang have to be so lazy and not retool anything? Maybe these cheap and cheerful KOs are just funding fodder for them to work on bigger and more premium projects, but when you've already got nice, thick and chunky plastic, and mostly nice and tight joints, having them fall short where they could have fixed things like this is still disappointing. All comes down to the price though, these are aimed at a cheaper market, and so, between the collective f**kery of Hasbro and Weijang, the legs are barely scaffolding. It's the same with most of Combiner Wars too, there's not much that could be done really. With all that said though, that's really the only issue I can think of. It's still a remarkable figure, even if the QC can be a bit weird at times. For example, on my copy, one of the shoulders is loose, as is one of my hips, and for some reason the plastic on this thigh piece is yellowed? What? Also, this part clearly wasn't assembled properly. Whoops! And yeah, the chipping on the chest is still annoying, but I've already gone into detail on that. Faults and all, he's a lovely figure that doesn't really feel out of place with mainline Transformers, despite being an upscaled KO. I also like how Wei Jang made two different versions, one with a die-cast metal chest piece, which is the version you see here, and one in full plastic. This way, if you really do want to end up with a full upscaled combiner, you can have the legs be die-cast metal to keep the weight balanced, whilst everything else can be plastic. Also, not sure exactly when I'm going to put this in the video, but there is one slight paint difference from the original. The kneecaps are painted just a little bit differently, as you can see on the original. This was all black, but now it's been replaced to just the top section being black. Whippy! Of course, I'll never actually be combining him, but I suppose I should briefly go over the other modes. Leg mode is pretty average. I'm impressed with how much stronger the ratchet in the combiner peg ended up, but I'm also disappointed in the huge hollow section at the front of the shin. Also, and I can't believe I have to reiterate this in 2019, HAND FOOT GUN SUCK ASS! Arm mode is probably the cleanest of the whole line, but I don't think that there are any arm pieces on the same bulk level that he has, so it'll look out of place unless you use one of his mold mates. Also, you've still got the hollow section at the front this time, and it's somehow worse. And again, HAND FOOT GUN SUCK ASS! Personally though, none of that really matters to me. Given the obsession with G1 these days, Rook was always too good for the Protector Bots. In my case, he'll remain with the mainline peeps as a chunky Voyager who provides backup in the most dire of battles. We don't need no combiners! They're overrated anyway! Oh, f**k. 
but I'm dragging this on for way longer than I should. Let's move on to the articulation, which is surprisingly better than I thought it would be. The head is on a ball joint, which gets a little bit of side-to-side -side movement, which is odd considering the blocky nature of its design. The shoulders rotate and have ball joints for the full range of motion. He has bicep swivels, an elbow that gets just beyond 90, but sadly no wrist swivel. I guess the Hulk hands can do that though. The waist swivels with no issues, as it should, as it also has to act as the combiner, bicep swivel, and he has ball jointed hips. Finally, he's got thigh swivels, a 90 degree knee bend, and oh my, ankle tilts! I used to think ankle tilts were neither here nor there, but since Siege has come along, I've really come to appreciate them. For a size comparison, as I said earlier, he's a nice and chunky Voyager. He definitely echoes the classic style of Voyager with his sheer chunk. This makes him work as something more than just an average rank filler, although I do wish Generations would do more rank fillers instead of the same old animation characters done a million times. It's continuously unfortunate that in this day and age, the community still has such a hard-on for G1, and brilliant figures such as Rook get thrown out the window just because it's not the motorcycle that they grew up with. Oh no! In recent years, Rook has unfortunately been purged from history. I barely see anyone discussing the brilliance of this figure online. And maybe the only reason that I enjoy it is because he's been upscaled as such. I don't really think this guy would have worked as a deluxe figure, but as a Voyager, he really stands out as a highlight of the line. Despite his flaws, such as the complete negligence to fill in the gaps that they easily could have done if they had a higher budget, I highly recommend picking up this figure, especially the upscaled version. Much like Brunch, you don't actually have to use him as a combiner with the other figures. He works incredibly well on his own. And I mean, hey, if you do want the official deluxe version, he's pretty easy to find, especially since everyone's moved on to Groove for some reason. <sighs> I guess today's lesson is that nostalgia always trumps good taste.